So let me first start by putting things into context. Okay. So when, you, when people talk about the brain, there are actually many different levels that they could be talking about it on molecular. By cellular, I mean in what happens inside a cell on the, on the level of neurons and circuits, on cognition, behavior, and so on. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about is strictly on the neurons and circuits level. Okay. Why? Well, for the obvious reasons, I'm not equipped to talk to, 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 to do things, with work, to work with the molecular and uh, intracellular uh, things. And I like to make a, I'm very curious about what's really going on inside, so I like to make a direct connection to the neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. And if you work with cognition and behavior, right now there's not a very clear path between the two, the linkage between the two is not so clear, that people is mostly on the psychophysics, uh, phenomenological type of level. So that puts me in this, in this very, very narrow range where I couldn't make a direct connection to the, to the neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. And I want to try to convince you today that this is also the uh, level uh, that has the closest link to mathematics. Okay. So that's why I'm working in it. So the second point I want to make before getting in is that when I say the word the brain, I obviously don't know about the whole brain. Nobody does. Okay. So my <coughs> most of what I have done is I've worked mostly with vision, with visual cortex. So what I'm telling you is a lot of it has to do, it's, it's, it, it's uh, motivated by what I know about the visual cortex. I also know that the things that I, I'm trying to tell you, things that are not special to the uh, visual cortex. So you should take it to mean more general than visual cortex. But I certainly don't know about the whole brain, nowhere close. Okay. And then a uh, third point that I'd like to make is that this is going to be an idealized model. Okay? So that means it's a caricature. It's not exactly how it is. Okay? And I'm going to try to do it on three different levels. The first level is that I want to think of the, the brain, the whole global structure of the brain, as a hierarchical network of brain regions, subregions, and, so, and so on, each one of which is further subdivided into layers. And the second level is to look at what happens on these layers. Okay, so one layer at a time. And then these layers are pretty spatially quite homo the structures are quite spatially homogeneous, and they have lo a lot of local uh, um, circuits. And the third level is the level of local circuits. Okay, so these are the three layers: the kind of global organization, the layers, and then the local circuits. The local but circuits <coughs> couple of the 2D layers, or what? They are inside. They are local structures of 2D layers. I'm going to get into each one of those. Okay. <coughs> The layers are related to each other, so that th this will show up in the global structure. Okay, so now, but I'm not going to do that in that order. I will first do so for the first one. Uh, is certainly not. I, I'm just going to try to present some anatomical evidence that the structure that I'm presenting is not ridiculous. Okay, this is certainly not my work. I'm just telling you what I learned from uh, from from different parts of neuroscience, and then I will jump from there directly into the local circuits which puts you in the domain of dynamical systems. Okay? And then I will go back up from there to the uh, layer level. Bec that it's good to talk about this first, because these things are made up of a lot of local circuits with some longer range connections. Okay? And to, to, do the, to illustrate the third part, which I like to uh, uh, make a connection there to non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, only an analogy. Not saying that there's any kind of, uh, the not, not saying that the biology looks like the physics, not at all. It's just the setup. It looks a little bit like a non equilibrium step back. Okay. So, those are the three things that I will do. I will start with this first part where I'll just flash a bunch of pictures by you, things that neuroscientists have done to convince you that the picture I'm presenting is not ridiculous. Okay. It's kind of a low bar, isn't it? <laughs> 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 but okay, so this is the global organization. So okay. Sorry, in what? There is no. Oh, it's completely filled yeah. with feedback loops. So what does hierarchical mean? Oh, I mean, I mean that you divide into sub networks, and there are sub sub networks and sub sub networks inside. They are kind of recognizable like that, but the connections go every which way. So, the, so the, the, the object that I'm interested in is the cerebral cortex, which is this crinkly piece of uh, neural tissue. It's all crumbled up, tucked underneath your skull, and it's primarily responsible for things like sensory processing, perception, attention, language, and, and so on. Okay. Uh, what does it not do? It doesn't control the type of things like uh, your heartbeat. Uh, 
uh, your balance. Okay? Those things are controlled by some other part. This is kind of the more conscious thinking part of the brain. Okay? And the picture is kind of like this. Okay? So this is this, this thing that's all kind of folded up. If you open it up for us, it's about like this big. Okay? And it's two or three uh, millimeters thick, two, two to four millimeters thick. And uh, so, so um, I'm going to pretend that this is just a highly structured network of neurons. Truth be told, there are lots of other things. There are blood vessels that go in. There is a lot of there are, there's housing for the cables. There's a lot of other things like astrocytes that take care of housekeeping. Neuro neurons produce waste, and they have to be taken away. Okay, so these things are there's a whole lot of other things in there that people are only beginning to learn about. Okay, they don't know so much about it. So, but I'm my in my idealized world, it's just a network of neurons. Okay, and so they they are divided into all these. Okay, so the, the these things are neuroscientists have kind of marked out different parts of the brain of partitioning and schematically, I kind of think of it as like this. So if you want to say that it's not really just one whole mass, these are the kind of three pieces that I think of. One is the, the sensory cortices. It's a bunch of, there, there are specific locations for vision, for uh, hearing, uh, taste, touch. Okay, each one has a different location for it. Those are called the sensory cortices. And then there's the motor cortices that involves like, I raise my arm, the, 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 the part of the cortex that actually tells my muscles to, to move, but there's more to it than that because there's the planning that goes into it. Okay? Hmm? The planning. Okay? So when do I want to move my arm? <laughs> you do know that. These, these are the very uh, complicated regions. I'm just lumping a whole lot of things together and, and called association areas. Those areas is actually uh, distributed all over the place. It's not one piece like this. They are the parts that integrate the sensory information, memory, uh, they plan action, they, do ab they execute abstract thought. The prefrontal cortex, this piece right here, is, uh, is uh, we'll see what that's doing. So these three parts, uh, if you, you can, okay, it's, it's, it's not really three, right? But if you want to conceptualize, it's really basically the sensory, the, the, per the parts that when you perceive things from the outside, the motor that leads to actions, and everything else in between. That's linking it all up, okay? So uh, there's that. Now, each one, I said there are sub-networks. So, so take the visual cortex, for example, uh, which is located back here. I've never understood why. Uh, our eyes are in front, but the visual cortex is at the back. So it goes from your eyes. One, your, your optic nerve takes it right to something here. And then one, one neuron, one synapse, bang, and it's back there, okay? So it's back there, it's drawn at the back of the head. It's not like the way it's shown. That's because the person drawing it had flattened the piece. It's actually all crinkled up and you cannot see it. They're hiding underneath each other, okay? But so now the visual cortex is divided into V1, which is also called a primary visual cortex. That's where the, the signal comes in. V2, V3, V4, and so 5 and you can count however many of the rest of them, they become kind of part vision, part planning, you know, it becomes un unclear which one it is. But V1 through V5, for sure, visual cortex. So they have somewhat different functions. V1, for example, it's, uh, it, it's very good at pinpointing the sp spatial uh, location of the object that you're looking at and, with, and the orientation of the edge there. So it basically tells you that this is a two-dimensional space because your retina is. <clears throat> at each point on the retina, some specific location, there's an edge pointed this way or that way. And that's what V1 is good for. Um, by the time you get to V4, but V1 has very small receptive fields. The neurons only see like really tiny bits of information. It's like it just really sees the, the bit of information there. It's about, it sees something like the quarter the size of the moon. Okay? And that kind of information, when you look up there, okay, you see some little bit there. Uh, there's an edge pointed this way or you know, this edge is vertical. It kind of sees that kind of things. By the time you get to V4, the receptive fields are much bigger. It's integrated the information together, and you see geometric shapes and forms. And V5 is about motion, by and large. V1 cannot see motion because it's gone out of <laughs> your receptive field. Right? What about color? Hmm? Color. 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 Color actually starts in V1. Okay. Mm -hmm. there, there are different pathways within V1. It, it starts in V1. <coughs> so, um, and then now, 
This is when you take the uh, this is when you take this sheet, you open it up into a two-dimensional sheet, and you can cut cut it up into regions. But that sheet, even though it's only two or three uh, millimeters thick, has layers. You can this is a real picture of it. You can see that it's made up of neurons that are distinct. Okay, they have different neuron types. You can see them. They have different densities. They do somewhat different things. Okay, and now here's a picture of what V1 looks like. Okay. So this is the picture of V1. The, they say six layers, but it's six is kind of an artificial number because then there's A, B, C, D <laughs> inside. Right? So it's really kind of more like, but basically the more people learn, the more <laughs> distinction that they make. Okay? But you can see that they have different, the, the outside projections end up in certain layers. They connect, they interconnect, some of them like that, and some come back. Okay? So there's the interlayer uh, connections. And that's basically kind of the picture. So what was, mm -hmm. what's this the picture on the left then? I mean, so these are? These are things that come from the uh, uh, retina the and LGN. The, the this one, the layer. It's a slice of a layer under the microscope. So, so these are just cells? Or these are cells. The, the little dots are cells. cells? Yeah. So it's deep line <coughs> deep? It's deep line deep, or is it horizontal? Oh, no. <coughs> so you open this sheet up, yeah. and this thickness has all the layers. Ah. Okay. So, so there's basically there's a two-dimensional surface area, and then there's the thickness, which consists of all well, these that's layers. The, that's the thickness. There, that's right? the thickness. Yeah. But the Roman numerals correspond to the Arabic numerals. Hmm. The Roman numerals there and the Arabic numerals. <laughs> no. No, no. They, 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 they're labeled one, two, three, four, five, six, like that. So, so for example, yeah, yeah, they, 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 they are. But you see, there's four, then four C, A, B, C, and then four C is gone alpha, beta. You know, so, so it's really not six. But, <laughs> but everybody will tell you. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. But this is not just the visual cortex, right? Most of the most of the cerebral cortex is made this layer structures. I don't know about everywhere, but a lot of places. Okay. It oh, look, looks exactly like. V, I thought this was just V1. But nah, this is not, no, no, it's the whole, whole thing. thing. Okay. You, you should, yeah. So you really right. should think of the cortex as really has this surface, and you cut up into regions, and then okay. a lot of places there's that. Okay, so this yeah, is the. You, mm -hmm. the you, you can see them. In the, mi in the microscope, you can see them. You can see the, them. You can see the connections. The cell types are different. Okay, and most of the connections are kind of sideways, and but there are also some that kind of go up or down. But they, 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 okay. they, they are by and large or not true. It's not too deep, but I'm gonna idealize it and call it too deep. It's not too deep. Okay, okay. They may be local. They may not be. Okay, so there, there's always some local circuit that's quite local, yeah. and some have longer range. But still, even when it's long range, it's short compared to the whole area of the of, of that region. Okay, that's why it kind of looks like statistical mechanics for that for that reason. Sort of like okay, so uh, this is a summary of the first part that I want to think of. I'm gonna I take the sheet. I want to open it up, cut it up into regions, and then subregions, and then the layers. The layers, I'm going to call it 2D, sheets of neurons. Okay? And it's made up of local circuits, so locally it's much denser. And it may have some longer range connections, <coughs> other connections. So I'm going to distinguish between local and others. Okay? <laughs> yes, everything, right? Okay, and everything else. Now, for other, you can think of it as lateral, which means kind of within that layer. It's primarily the, the layers, the boundaries, are of course, a little bit fussy. It's not so, not, okay? But lateral is primarily within that layer. Interlamina means that it's the same region, but you talk to different lamina. And interaerial with one part of the 2D surface to another part of the 2D surface. Okay? So there are all these kinds. There's feed forward feedback, but feed forward feedback makes no sense except only at the very beginning. Because once you go inside, what is forward and what is back, it goes <laughs> all over the place. Okay? Does it make sense to approximate a thin layer with something two dimensional? That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, OK, so this is kind of the picture. You should think of the each stack as like a bunch of layers. Okay, so they have things that they're always talking. In, there's always intralaminar ones. Not not always, always, but mostly, and they talk up and down like that. Okay, and then this one stack talks to another stack. This is kind of my 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 cartoon of it. And so here's one more thing: is that very roughly speaking, the local circuits are randomly connected. 
no, it's not random, but it looks fairly random, and it's not clear how much it matters that it's not. But, I mean, look, look when, when in development, you center an exon someplace when there is room, right? When it's too crowded, you're not going to go there. It's not, uh, it's, it's not random, but it looks pretty random. Compared to uh, these other ones, compared to the uh, interlamina and interarea ones, n n neurons never send axons out randomly to some place. It never happens. It's very specific when it goes farther away. It goes from here to there. Okay? When you land exactly that location, there's some randomness. But it never, it, there's nothing random about it from one region of the brain to another. It's only very, very local. Hmm? Are these things sparse or are they quite dense in terms of connection? Uh, depends on what you mean by. <laughs> like, does each neuron have twenty neighbors or three neighbors? Thousands. Any? Thousands. Okay. Hundreds to thousands. Hundreds. Ooh. Hundreds to thousands. Hundreds uh, near themselves, and then they send bunches to like another fifty here, another fifty there, and then and they form all kinds of loops back and forth. That's kind of the global. Yeah, c compared to the number of neurons there is, it's very sparse. <laughs> it's a, the number of neurons in our head is roughly 10 to the 11. Okay. So it's not 10 to the 26, but it's a big number. Okay. So this is the end of the first part. Okay. And so the, I'm going to jump now to local populations. I want to give you some feeling for what a local population looks like. And then before I go to the, the whole sheet, when I go to the two sheet, I will need something to illustrate, uh, which is a <coughs> model that I've been working on for the last several years. Okay, okay so local populations. Now, I'm going to make a model. It's a toy model. It's very simple. The worst aspect of it is that it's isolated. Okay? Now, local populations are not isolated. They are linked to everything else. Okay? I'm going to just have this local, a few hundred neurons, thousand neurons, they are okay, low, I, they, you have some connection probabilities, you just form a network. Okay? And I'm going to use integrated and fine neurons, which I'm going to uh, define for you. But the main thing I want to get into your head is that there are lots and lots of such models. I want to make one that looks like the local circuits in real cortex. Okay? So it's not a, it's, it's, of course it's abstract, it's idealized, but I'm trying to make it look like what I know to be the real cortical neurons. Okay? So the general layout is that it's a few hundred to two or three thousand. Uh, depends on how you count, really. They kind of ooze out, so how, you know, when you cut out a single piece, it's very hard to say, but think about the numbers, 1,000. Think about it, kind of like that. And almost always, everywhere in the brain, there are three quarters the, of the neurons are called excitatory and the other inhibitory. When excitatory neurons spike, they excite everyone else. When inhibitory neurons spike, they, they, they suppress everybody. Okay. And also borrowing these numbers all from kind of neurophysiology, or anatomy rather, that E to E is relatively sparse. So it's kind of quite more selective, uh, excitatory to excitatory. All the inhibitory neurons, all these things are much more uh, closely, they're, they're, they're denser. Okay, so um, it, when I say 15%, it's only kind of very local. It dies off with distance in cortex, right? So I don't know whether this is sparse or not sparse. <laughs> Uh, com if you take some region, it's connect each neuron is connected to roughly 50% of other neurons. It's, it's, not, it's not sparse. So all these models, they say sparse coupling, let's take the coupling, go to zero. They are very wrong models, actually, they, <laughs> because they are connected to half of them. This is in a small region, right? So like spatial extent really matters. If you talk about here and that, okay, the connectivity is very, very low. Okay, so uh, in, in, the, in, in such a model, of course, I choose my, my, my connections randomly, right? This is a toy model, okay? And because I, I'm not connected to the rest of the brain, I'm going to use external drive, which is just a Poisson kick. Just give it a drive like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are the equations governing neuronal dynamics? Okay, this is called a leaky integrate and fire uh, model, okay? And mostly, so, so what this equation tells you about, the V is the membrane potential of a neuron. So each neuron has a membrane that separates the, soup in, the, the stuff inside from the soup outside, and you're measuring the membrane potential. And it sits actually roughly at negative 60 milli, millivolts or so. Okay? But let me normalize it and put it between 0 and 1. Okay? So it's only time dependence, no, no spatial dependence here, right? 
each neuron. Okay, so I'm giving you the, 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 the dynamics. So this is a coupled dynamical system with a lot of different things coupled together. This is looking at just one neuron, yeah. what it does, okay? So, yeah, one neuron. So th this, the membrane potential is going up and down. It's driven by three terms. The first one is a leak, okay? So if nothing happens, it will leak down to zero. It just goes down there, okay, like that, okay? And there's a time constant which determines everything else, okay? And the second term is, is, this is the excitatory current. Okay, maybe I should put these things up, okay? So the second term, this is the excitatory current. And this is the conductance, and you are getting driven to an imaginary point, VE, way up there, okay? That's like four or five times the height of the whole thing. So there's some force that is trying to drive you up there, but you don't get there. By the time you get to one, you spike. But the force is trying to drive you up there. And then there's an inhibitory current, which is trying to drive you to some imaginary point below zero. You also don't really go there. Okay? You just, yeah, these, so there's just three forces acting on it. Okay? So where do these uh, uh, excited th the currents come from? They come from when you receive a spike from a neuron that's connected to you. That neuron spikes. And what happens is that your conductance, the, 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 this is the this is this part, okay, uh, just goes up, whoop, like that for a few milliseconds. Okay, it only lasts a few milliseconds. It disappears, okay? So every time you receive a spike, you kind of go up a little bit, okay? So when you go up a little bit, that means that that force is getting, that current is getting bigger, okay? So you're constantly receiving a lot of spikes coming in from excitatory neurons, from inhibitory neurons, so it's kind of constantly jerking you up and down, and the, the, the membrane potential is a, a kind of a fluctuating thing. So there is a... Are you impacting the hmm? That's Sorry? how you respond to what comes to you. That's right. That's right. So there, if, there's a, if there's a neuron that synapses on you, it's a very specific thing. It's kind of like, like this, that they kind of go like that. So you receive this thing, and it causes for a few, just a few milliseconds, you change your conductance a little bit. And you change your conductance, and there's a... The, the current will try to push you up, but they, you see, they, they, they receive hundreds of spikes from different things all the time, right? So, so and, uh, and there, there, there are these numbers. Uh, this is like how much it moves you up or down, so the amount that it moves you up. So these things can, to some degree, be measured from experiments and from some, <coughs> and some are deduced, okay? So uh, I'm, I'm... You're not necessarily obeying the day law. Mm -hmm. you, you are not obeying the... Uh, no. It's either excitatory or inhibitory. You have both of them. Uh, I, I have I have both of them. There are two kinds of when which which neuron. Okay, so uh, so so here's the uh, uh, so the, this is the, the what I showed you before was the inhibitory ones, and then there's the excitatory one. It does exactly the same thing. Um, so the, they, they cause the changes that are caused a little bit different. The inhibitory ones are longer. The excitatory ones are more transient. So now, if you look at that equation, it's, in, in, it's exceedingly simple, right? There's nothing, because how, how, this is like a linear equation, except that it comes in this GE of t, which depends on minus t spike means the arrival time of a spike, okay? So the, the equation is an extremely simple one. What makes it complicated is this coupling to other neurons, okay? So when somebody spikes on you, it causes a change. So you can see that the, 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 it kind of causes it to come. So, so be because you can, it's hard to control when uh, the spikes arrive, because you see your membrane potential is kind of going like that, and then it suddenly it takes off and it reaches some threshold, right? When it reaches the threshold, and then you start to send a signal to all the ones that are uh, downstream for, uh, that, that you synapse on, and, and then they, they receive something, yeah, they're so conducting. The way you when you, when you spike, okay? So that's, that's why this is like, in some sense, a very easy thing to simulate because they, they until you spike, uh, you don't talk to anybody. <laughs> yeah. There is an asymmetry. If somebody spikes you, can you spike him also? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's not always, but it can, yeah. Not at the, probably not at the same time, but actually very quickly if I excite you, uh, you're in another excitatory neuron, yeah, you will very quickly excite me, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. So, uh, so, uh, so the main parameters are really, you know, uh, the, the weight in, in, this, in this kind of really uh, toy model, and there's, and there's the drive, okay. 
And so we try to uh, use experimental guidance to put these things into it. You, you look at dynamical systems with six, param six parameters, it's impossible to study because you cannot study, you cannot explore parameter range, right? But it's not random. There's experimental guidance on how big each spike is. They can measure, like, when you receive a spike, how, go how high do you go and so on. Not completely, because you know, when most of the time when they measure it is when they isolate a neuron, which behaves completely different than the one in your head. <laughs> so so there, there is information and there isn't information. Okay. okay, so mathematically, this is really a dynamical system. It's a coupled dynamical system with like 3n, for example, with uh, the equations, uh, one for membrane potential and two for conductances, for example. Okay. Uh, depending on how you do it, it could be stochastic differential equation, it could be delay differential equation, it could be just ODE. If you put something in, it could even be PDE. Okay. Okay, but concept uh, it, uh, th those are kind of <coughs> details in some ways. Okay. So conceptually, it's really a network of small dynamical systems. And uh, it, uh, can you go back, can you see the nonlinearity in the equation? Hmm? Where's the nonlinearity in the equation? It all reacts, there is no, it all comes in the time of arrival of the coupling. coupling. Yeah, it's in coupling, the arrival time of the spikes, right? The equation itself is very simple. It just adds up what it is and then it goes. But, but how, who, how, how can you estimate it? It's kind of like the thing, kind of, it's almost like a random walk with a drift going up to the top, right? Well, it's kind of hard to know exactly. Hmm? There's a threshold for firing. Right, right. Yeah, that's that whole thing is a nonlinearity, and then the other people, yeah, it's like a drive that's very nonlinear. <coughs> in reality, when you spike, you don't really get cut off at some point. You actually make a huge excursion, and then you get way down like this. So in this simple model, you just chop the top <laughs> and the bottom off and say, "I'm not going to look at it <laughs> like that." Okay, so for a couple milliseconds, nothing much can happen. But then you continue. So okay. you're assuming that all neurons obey the same equation. Right? Yes, but you the numbers like should try. You should jiggle them some. Yeah, you should put some randomness so in. It should be. But even if you are. don't, it's already uh, kind of pretty complicated. Right? You can make the you can make these things kind of arbitrarily realistic. Right? But anyway, so so with this dynamical system, okay. Uh, the, of course, the very first question that you would ask are the existence and uniqueness of uh, invariant measure or, or stationary state. And I didn't really do this, but depending on how exactly you formulate it, it can be done or it cannot be done, depending on how exactly you form the equation. Well, what's the stationary state of the brain? <laughs> <laughs> this thing is hopefully not in your brain. It's an isolated <laughs> little group. <laughs> but save that question for later. <laughs> Okay, so this is uh, just some really local uh, thing, right? But some little local group. Okay. So I would like to think, I would like you to think of the stationary state as uh, it's a dynamic equilibrium between E and I neurons. Okay. So the, the thing is that the two main players in here are excitatory and inhibitory neurons. <coughs> These two groups are constantly trying to do opposite things to each other. So the balance is kind of where the equilibrium is, sits. This is how, kind of how I like you to think about it. But so you have more than <coughs> one equilibrium state. Hmm? Do you have a number of equilibrium states? Uh, for, depending on how you set up the picture, okay? If I set it up a little differently, you will get lo lots the way I set it up, unless you're extremely unlike. See, see, when I say connectivity, there's a question of realization, right? So for the typical realization, there's only one. Okay. But it, it, these things all change the questions if I just change a little bit. <coughs> Hmm? What does <coughs> mean? It means that if you look at the picture now, uh, the, the events that happen doesn't change. If you take some other point in time and you look at it, it has Instead exactly the of same. Number of in a given state. Oh, I, I mean the events. See, it's constantly fluctuating, right? I'm going to, but the likelihood of different events happening are the same if you look now than if you look a day later. Okay. So now it's so not true that. Where, where did you have the, the, you said something about Poisson, but I forgot where The drive, was. Poisson drive to individual neurons. Somebody has to drive it, right? Otherwise yeah, yeah. it would sit at the bottom. So, but, uh, but they were receiving signals too from other, other places. Oh, and, and other, yeah, but in here, see, there's no other place in this okay, model, this right? So it's all, okay, it's all so Poisson, this right? Is this is like a real simple self-contained okay. thing that you can, and, and you can really try to prove theorems on. Yeah, you can really try to prove theorems about this one. This is the level where you can, uh, when you can hope to do that. So now I said that there is no, there 
there, there, there is, uh, you cannot know exactly what the firing rate is, you can estimate. Okay? So here's one way to estimate. Okay? If you look at dv dt, that means how the rate of the membrane potential, and remember I set it to 0, 1. Okay? So if I do, do this thing and I don't set the v back to 0, I'll be counting the number of times I fire. Okay? This would be firing rate of e-neurons. Well, leak, let's forget about that for a while, okay? So E neuron, that's the number of presynaptic E cells, the number of cells that synapse on it, times their firing rate, times the coupling, times the average distance to that imaginary point to which I try to drive it. And there's external drive, there's I. So you can write this thing down, some linear equation, you can solve it. It will give you some idea of the firing rate, okay? It will give you some idea. You can just Take averages, take bulk considerations. Not my idea. Wilson Cowan, a long time ago, already tried to do this. Okay, so everybody, okay, this is, but you can get some idea. So what's wrong? Okay, it's, there's something not quite right about it. The 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 biggest problem is that there's inhomogeneous firing patterns, and firing patterns matter. Okay, so I want to give you one example. There's the leak term. Okay, that I told you. Uh, let's forget about it. Okay. Well, as it turns out, if you completely forget about it, it's not so good. Okay. So suppose I'm going to clap 20 times okay, in the course of uh, uh, each clap means a spike is coming in. Okay. So if, if, suppose every second I clap 20 times. If I go <coughs> like that, okay, so that's not 20, not per second, right? But what happens is the leak is going to leak. It just leaks away, and nothing much happens. Okay. Because I clap, it goes up, and then leak, and it goes up. Okay. I sh shoot you over a few times. It's going to generate a few spikes. Okay, so so the pattern matters. Okay, it's not just so many spikes per second. It's the patterns in which these things are received. Then they matter. Okay, so I don't really, I don't think there's a. I, I haven't figured out how. To, I'm, I'm working on how to figure out a way to kind of uh, in, in, uh, incorporate the bulk and the correction. Uh, if you really try to study it, I don't think you can. Okay, so this is the. Um, so the, but the, this equilibrium is an invariant measure. An invariant measure is characterized not just firing rates. Firing rates is an important thing, but it's not just that, right? It's got a whole lot of other things. So I want to show you one, one example of something, namely gamma band rhythms. Okay? So gamma band rhythms are an example of an emergent phenomenon. Okay? So what is an emergent phenomenon in a network? Okay, in a network, an emergent phenomenon is one that occurs as a result of the interactions of the different components of the network. So it's a network driven by local rules. If you look at the local rules, you would never see these things. But when they interact among themselves, they produce new things that happen that cannot be deduced from the local rules. <coughs> this is an, so I want to show you one example of an emergent phenomenon, which is gamma rhythms. So what are gamma rhythms? They are rhythms that are between, some people say 40 to 90, some people say 30, 120, whatever, okay? It's, it's an irregular rhythm. Now, <laughs> so what's an irregular rhythm? A rhythm, but it's not regular, okay? And it's detected all over the brain, okay? They, they, lots and lots of different parts of the brain, you measure it and you just measure this boop, 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 like that. And, and so, you know, it's in a lot of biology where people think, that, you know, when something is there, it's usually for a purpose, right? So what is that for, okay? People have looked for it. People try to explain it in terms of it must be because of this and that, okay? They never found any use for it, okay? They never found it, okay? And so there is also the, some things that, also there's been proposed that, oh, it's, uh, it's, it's, imp uh, it's, uh, it's important for communication or it's a clock, it's, uh, okay? It may have some uses, but um, people are increasingly starting to think that maybe it's just a byproduct of neuronal processes and it's really not doing much of anything. Okay. It's, that's possible too. So I'd like to show you what it looks like. Okay. So first, you should understand what a single neuron does. Okay. I took 10 because I cheated. I, 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 I wanted not to run it for so long, <laughs> so I <laughs> 10 of them. But if you take one neuron, and so you, uh, there's the kind of, in the kind of model that we're talking about, and you let it fire, and you measure the times between spikes. See the really long tail? Okay. Okay. So the times between spikes could be very short, could be 10, 20 milliseconds, because it would be 100, 120. Okay. So it's very, okay. So people have, be, uh, have, have approximated this with all kinds of things, exponential distributions, you know, uh, heavier tail or whatever. And even if you give it a periodic drive, look what happens. It's not periodic. The response is like some 
really fussy things. Okay, it it just it so the the fact that it looks so much like this is called ISI inter inter spike uh, intervals. The fact that from one spike to the next, looking like an exponential distribution, says that it always looks like random, right? It's random. The, the firing time of the next spike is going to come at a random time. That's what exponential it distribution is. So you're looking at one? Uh, yeah, it should be, it should be one. In yeah. your system, and mm -hmm. you, you just and pick one. You have the random initial. They, they're, they're in, yeah, and they are you in. You always see this picture. You always see a distribution that looks like yeah, this. Right. <coughs> okay. mm -hmm. Not exactly, but always this distribution yeah, that looks like that. Yeah. Okay. But that's, that, that kind of tells you that when a neuron spikes, the next spike is going to come at a random time, right? If it was really an exponential distribution. Poisson. Yeah, the Poisson uh, in, in between, yeah. However, OK, so, so there's a reason for this, OK? So if, if you think about the fluctuating current that produces the thing, it's kind of like a random walk, right? The, 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 the in excitatory spikes come in, inhibitory spikes come in. It's like kind of like a random walk with a drift up, OK? So, and, and so if you look at random walk and you look at the time that it takes from 0 to go to 1, uh, that's an inverse Gaussian distribution. And so it's like a first passage time for, 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 for okay? and it looks kind of like that, okay? So that's the explanation that people give, okay? Now, it's different if you put a bunch of them together, okay? So now, th this is a called a, what is called a raster. The, uh, and the vertical, the horizontal is time, vertical is neuron number. And I must confess that I cheated because I, some of my neurons have more, uh, have more input than others. That's why the, the bottom part is spiking much more. Okay? So I, I just I didn't have a convenient one, so I grabbed this one. But anyway, so you, you can pretend that, that that's not there. Okay, so what do you see there is that they're not random at all. They form clusters. They form a bunch of spikes, and then they kind of group together. Okay, okay. And do they have shared input at all, or does each have its own cluster? Independent. Yeah, you can have them share some. It won't. Okay. This thing is not something that you need to tweak parameters to get. As a matter of fact, you can try, and you won't get rid of it. It's going to do that. Okay. Uh, you, it can be fainter. It can be more uh, synchronized, but you won't. There'll be some trace of it. Now, I assure you, there's no organization in this network that was programmed into it. The links are randomly drawn. Poisson input independent, okay? It's an emergent behavior. From a single neuron, there's nothing that says that they're going to form this pattern, but they just do. Okay, so uh, just, uh, just to show you a little bit more. But so in case you think that they are spiking synchronously, no. If you look at the E neurons, at any one point in time in, in every like five millisecond, kind of, the, the gaps between them is kind of like 20 milliseconds. If you look at any five millisecond bin, it's only like 10% of them that are firing. It's a different 10% though that's firing. It's an emergent. These emergent. are all simulations. Hmm? These are all simulations. These are all sim uh, yeah, these are, th this, this, th these are all simulations. It's not so different from the real measurements. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so yeah. Neurons yeah. You can measure LFPs, but th that's a little different. Now, the part that I want to show you is actually this picture. So this is what is called uh, wandering frequencies. And it happens a lot. It happens in, in, in neuroscience a lot. Okay. So what this is, is it's easier if I tell you rather than to read that. Okay. So you, you take a time interval, say 200 millisecond. You look at, so, so you have a, some spike train. A lot of, say, I don't care who is spiking, right? I just take the spikes from the whole population. I look at 200 milliseconds. Okay. And let me, pre uh, so there are some spikes there. Let me pretend that this thing is periodic, and I'm going to compute my Fourier coefficients. So I calculate my Fourier coefficients, and I know where the Fourier power sits. It likes to have, it likes to be concentrated at so many hertz like that. But then I shift this window. I keep shifting it, and this is the picture that I get. Okay, so you can see that the power is concentrated, or really concentrated, sometimes high, sometimes low. Now it got into 70, and now it goes down to 40, 50. Okay, but it's not random. This this thing, this is one second, whereas the the, uh, the, the, the period in between is, act is actually f fires like 60 times a, a second, right? So, I mean, it's, so it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's wandering frequencies. It drifts, the frequency drifts. This happens all over. This is, this is a very, very normal standard phenomenon that happens. It's, so it's, uh, 
dynamical systems, we don't have anything like this. I want to understand uh, how, how do you formulate this. I don't know. But see, it's all self-organized. The thing just makes it by itself. Okay? So, uh, so people have tried time ago. Nancy Coppell started was the first one. This is basically a two-neuron model. So, so he pr she produces things that look uh, much straighter than, 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 than mine. And then people say, OK, why don't I add some noise to periodic? Okay? If you add some noise to period, it would be focus at one point with Gaussian distribution around it, uh, you can tell that it is not that because it actually stays, <laughs> it kind of stays someplace. It, it really lasts for a while. It, it, okay. There's a memory. Okay. So this is one of the first things that I started to do and I started to produce this thing. Called, it's, 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 so, the, so the picture is kind of that, that I, I, I'm, I'm still trying to make this quantitative. I know qualitatively how it works now, but I don't know how to do it quantitatively. Is that, so there is some crossing of threshold by some neurons. Okay? And the crossing, when, when, when these neurons cross, it depends on who they synapse on. If the guys that they synapse on are not close to threshold, nothing much happens. If it's close, then they cross over, and then they start to drag some other ones over. Okay? So it's like a chain reaction that, that, that can start, but it depends on who is sitting there. Now, oh, but don't forget, there are the eye neurons. When you drag the E neurons over, you take the I neurons over too. Okay? When they, and so the I neurons will try to stop you. So it depends on whether they come in very quickly and stop you, or they don't. <laughs> so this is so th this is the kind of the result of that. Okay, last part of the talk. Okay. So um, I'm going to the sheet now. Okay. The sheet is this is uh, 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 so so the part of that I'm interested in is. Uh, so I, I have to use something as an example, so I'm not talking in the abstract. This is a model. This is called a realistic computational modeling. Realistic means that it's on the level of neurons and circuits, not on the level of intracellular or beyond. It's really on the circuit level. Okay? Uh, Bob Shapley is a, <laughs> is, is a real neuroscientist. Okay? He's the one who keeps me honest. Okay? And Logan Charaka is uh, here at IES right now. She, uh, he's not here right now, but all the simulations are done by him. Okay? And so th what this model does is that, so we have built a model. We're trying to kind of expand it into a bigger and bigger one. But right now, it's a model. So this is the stimulus. This is just a, a symbol for the stimulus. It goes, this is a piece of LGN. So when information reaches a retina, it goes directly to there are two little structures on the two sides called the lateral geniculate nuclei and LGN. So this is a piece of the mount that's there. And from there, it goes directly to the visual cortex. And we are studying the input layer. But the input layer is, doesn't stop there. It already, this is the far and away the simplest part. That's why it can be modeled. But even so, it goes up and down. It cycles between layer 6 and layer 4C alpha. And this is not a closed circuit because layer six talks to <laughs> a whole bunch of other things. So we cannot model that. That's why our model of layer six is totally unrealistic. But the rest of them tries to be realistic. Okay. Uh, and so we, we have been doing this for, for it's uh, stuck. It's not moving. So while you're doing that, let me ask a question. So do you have different coupling matrices between different neurons here, or are they okay. have shared? They say, okay. Are they random, or what do you we, we, we use it ran, ran randomly drawn. And okay, when, you, when, you draw, when you take another realization of the network, things are, of course, going to be a little bit different. But any phenomenon that's not stable, I, I'm not going to look at, <laughs> because I don't, I don't want to look at. So most of the things that I tell you, um, you can do it every which way. It will change the firing rate by half a spike. And I guess the question would have to what extent is random a good model for this? No, it's not a. Lo no, no, no. Locally, it's not. Locally, it's close enough to being random. It's not random. Okay, it, it's it's close enough to being random that I find that it doesn't matter too much. Uh, farther away, it's not random at all. Okay, For basically the whole. Okay, you managed to make it work. You can click on the. Wait, I'm. Next uh, slide. No, I cannot do do that. <coughs> Okay, so let's see. Okay, it's working so far. All right, okay. Oops, uh, it's working here, but not there. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> ah, okay, okay. So, uh, the, so uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into model details that wouldn't, it wouldn't interest you so much, but the most relevant fact is that there is something called a retinotopic map. Not only on, now on the retina, you can imagine that there's a, when you look at it like that, there's a map of your visual field on the retina, right? This thing is actually passed to LGN and passed to cortex. So everywhere, there's a map of the same thing. So that there are spatial locations that correspond to specific points on your retina. And th those are just some kind of numbers. So, so the the so in 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 cortex, uh, so p the, these squares are uh, human constructs. It's not really, it's, it's not really in, in there. But it's easy to identify a bunch of neurons as, as having essentially the same receptive field that they see the same point. Okay, so mathematically, it's easy to just divide them up into like that. But there's also that each group of neuron has uh, an orientation preference. I was talking about that they get excited by edges in different locations. So I'm going to get in a little bit more into that. Okay. So the mo one of the most important properties of uh, V1 is orientation selectivity and the specificity of spatial location. Right? Thus, that specificity comes from the, uh, the retinotopic map. There's a copy of map of your visual field to the retina, to LGN, to V1. It's just a, a map, okay? Um, kind of really like the kind of map that you have. <coughs> but orientation, uh, but orientation selectivity. Now here's the very curious part, okay? So this is LGN. LGN has two kinds of cells, on and off. They are basically change detectors, okay? What the LGN does is that it takes derivatives, okay? So it, uh, it only sees a little tiny location in visual space, and when that location goes from light to dark, uh, the off cells are excited, go bang, 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 so spike like that. Or it goes from dark to light, then the other one spikes. Okay? That's all that they do. Okay? They, they see a really tiny visual field, and then they, 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 just, they just detect a luminous change. change. If, it, if it stays put, then whatever it does, doesn't do anything. Okay? And they certainly don't have any orientation preference. There's none, right? They just light, dark, dark, light, that's all. Okay? But by the time you get to uh, the cortex, this is a real picture of uh, some imaging uh, that's done um, uh, that, that of images the orientation domain. So each color represents uh, 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 a bunch of neurons that favor some directions. Okay? So you group like a bunch of them together, and you call, that's corresponded to my square <laughs> of uh, hypercolumns. Okay? So, so, so how does it go from here to there? You know, from, there's nothing between LGN and cortex. LGN just sees one spot, light, dark, light, dark, and then by the time you get a cort cortex, they prefer it, okay? And that's the very, very well-known uh, theory of Hubo and Weasel, okay? So Hubo and Weasel, this is, uh, this is kind of a, a side thing, but I thought that I should mention it, even though I'm not talking about orientation selectivity, is that they, f they figured out, they proposed, is, is, uh, in math, one would call it a conjecture, okay? About how this orientation selectivity comes about has to do with each neuron picks like some number of LGN neurons. The, sp the spatial configuration of these on-off would tell you how to uh, whether what 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 direction the neuron is excited by. That's a, another story, but I thought I would mention that. And one reason I want to mention that is something that I said earlier. So, I'm a V1 neuron. I am hooked to four, let's say four LGN neurons. Okay. Now, each one of those four will have light. When I drift the grading through, each one of those four will spike the same number of times. What does it have to do with which side the grading comes from? It will still spike the same number of times in the course of a second. Okay? So, how, so how can I possibly know the, which direction I prefer if they spike the same number of times? <coughs> the answer is it doesn't come from the number of spikes that you receive. It cannot. Because you really receive exactly the same number of spikes. It's the pattern. Okay. So what happens is that depending on how you hook it up, when the pattern comes this way, you will receive the spikes in concentrated form. And if it comes this way, they will all kind of evenly spread out. And that's so patterns ma matter. It's not really just spike. Okay. So this is uh, a model output. So. This is my schematic picture. Uh, it's a mathematical model, right? Uh, so each one of these is like a, 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 a hypercolumn means, means that it looks at some region in visual space. These neurons are hooked up to LGN in particular ways to, it's designated as 
preferring edges like that, preferring edges like that, okay? So this is kind of more or less the, the this, this is a mathematical model. It's kind of like the, <laughs> it's a version of that, right? It's a version of the thing on the right-hand side, but this is a mathematical model, okay? So now, so the, people like to use drifting gradings because uh, you see it detects change, right? So when you drift, you will see the like that, like that changing successfully. And you would excite the neurons that prefer the vertical if you drift this thing that way, okay? Now it also simulates the way we see because no matter how hard you try, you cannot keep your eyes still. Your eyes will be moving like this. <laughs> so, so it's kind of like a drifting grading in some ways, okay? So look at this one. Zero means vertical, like that, okay? So when you drift like this, these, the ones that prefer vertical, so okay, this diamond here, this diamond here, and the three half diamonds there, are supposed to light up. The colors indicate firing rate. The hotter colors are high firing. Blue is uh, low firing. Hey, look at that. It's the E neurons and the I neurons at the same time. They're all firing, okay? So this is a, this is a model with about 50,000 neurons, um, okay? So, and each pixel here is about 30, okay? So what this is, is an activity map. It's kind of, analogous to fMRI or uh, other op optical <coughs> imaging, but it's on a neuronal level, okay? It's on, so it's on a neuron, okay? I, I, I could, if, if I make it any, well, any, it, it, this is, I've already done some core screening here, otherwise it's kind of too, 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 de too detailed. Oh, and if you go to a horizontal, this is a grading that goes like this, so you say, ah, it's, these guys should be, I, I guess, well, they're the ones that lit up, okay? So if I go uh, 45 degrees, and you look here, oh, there's no 45 degree, but uh, this is 30 and 60 is closest. So these three are the ones then. So they kind of integrate the information. And this, this, okay. So this, uh, um, so, so th this, this is a kind of maps that I, I, I kind of, I find very useful because uh, in order to get them to work, you really have to get everything right to, at the same time because it's, it's pretty demanding. It's locally has to be right, has to kind of communicate with it. Okay. So now, these maps, so I've been asked a number of times, uh, did you match these things against uh, what, what is uh, real experiments? No, I haven't. One of the reasons is that they can't make them yet. Okay. See, one of the problems with uh, neuroscience measurements is that if you use things like uh, fMRI, it depends on blood flow, oxygen levels on blood flow. You don't have the temporal resolution. It's very slow. Uh, okay. so, so, so you forget about that. And okay, uh, you can me measure electrical activity, EKG, stick a blob of gel in there, okay, now it's very sensitive. But you lost your spatial resolution. Okay. So it's very hard in, to have both spatial and temporal resolutions together. <laughs> They're getting better and better. Um, you can't get, but in, in a simulation, of course, you can down to any level in any spatial, okay? But so, so they get, they're getting closer, but by and large, it's, it's not easy to get. There's also the scale. When you measure what happens in one, it's very hard to see the whole piece. When you measure the whole piece, you lost the individual neurons altogether. This is one of the biggest problems in the, kind of the, uh, in the field, right? So, um, so I'm getting to the, the, the kind of the closer to the last 10 minutes of the talk, and I want to try to make a, a connection. To I want to suggest that the responses across a cortical surface can be understood as microscopic rules, meaning neuron to neuron coupling kind of rules, plus a continuum of local equal dynamic equilibria. In analogy, in setup, okay, I want to emphasize not in science, in setup only with non-equilibrium step back. Okay, so, it, so just to back up a tiny bit, in equilibrium step back, okay, so you have Hamiltonian system, you have invariant distribution, and you have the distributions given by E to the minus beta H, H Hamiltonian, beta is inverse temperature. Okay, so now I'm going to think of a non-equilibrium as putting a same, so think, think about a piece of matter, originally it was just in contact with one heat bath, right? Now I'm gonna put it in contact with three different unequal heat baths, so then you're gonna start to create fluxes and different things happen, okay? So there is the idea of local thermal equilibrium, which I find very useful for purposes of explaining these things in neuroscience, is that, okay, so what, what this says is that uh, when the system is like, so this part of the room is much hotter than that part, but you know, so does the idea of local temperature make sense? Well, locally, 
in, in, in a not so much microscopic, but a mesoscopic scale, the picture could look like this is more physics than mathematics, but okay. the idea is that locally, it looks like a system in equilibrium, but with a different temperature. Okay, this is, okay. So this is the idea that I want to kind of. Uh, you think of it as stationary? Yes, you want, you want to think of it conditioned the right way. What you see is what really looks a lot like as a piece of matter in equilibrium, except that the, t the temperature is different, as is location dependent. But the temperature changes time? No, no. No, this is a non-equilibrium steady state, as S, okay? In a non-equilibrium steady state, okay? okay? So in a non-equilibrium steady state, locally is like a steady state, okay? So now the advantage of this viewpoint, okay? And of course, this is absolutely nothing new. I'm trying to kind of put it into neuroscience, okay? Uh, the, the, uh, the advantage of this is that the local distributions, if it's, that is true, is defined by a finite number of parameters. So you kind of know what they are locally. It's only got a finite number of flavors. I mean, not flavors, but parameters, right? So it's okay. And so it, depending on how it's set up for certain kinds of uh, uh, st step back systems, the local distributions can be obtained by, okay. You, w see, if you know what happens locally, <laughs> then you know what the outfluxes are. So you know how the different local groups are connected. So by balancing these fluxes, you would get the whole thing. So the problem is reduced from finding an invariant measure from a huge dynamical system to finding, solving a finite number of equations to link up, how do I link up these? Uh, uh, because the, the big thing that got your head is that you know locally what the things are. Okay? It's a big, big advantage. So are, I, are you going to drive it? Is it going to be driven <laughs> somehow or, or not? Yeah, are you, are it's going to be driven. I'm not going to make the, okay, no, I'm not, I'm not uh, yeah. So oh, so right, right? Yeah. So so now I want to kind of get to the uh, cortical network. Okay. So for example, visual cortex, but certainly not just the visual cortex. So I want to think okay, what what is analogous. First of all, if you look at one sheet, it's spatially homogeneous. The structures are spatially homogeneous. Okay. Meaning that if you look, uh, not, I'm not saying that you have all-to-all -all coupling. Okay. This guy is certainly not so. Uh, I mean, it's mostly local coupling. Okay, not so far away. But if I look here, the structure, and I look there, they look very, very similar. So it's kind of very much analogous to like a piece of material that's <laughs> homogeneous. Okay? Um, the, 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 couple, the, the neurons is actually roughly isotropic. It kind of goes okay, like that. Okay? And s some layers have longer range connections, so not just local circuits. It goes like a, a few rings out, but it's still very short compared to the size of the layer, which I can think of as infinite. So this is the first. Okay? that is as structurally is a piece of something that's quite homogeneous. Secondly, the input to the layer is extremely spatially inhomogeneous. Okay? That, see, it's, uh, it's like imagine a sheet of metal and you're driving different spots uh, to different temperatures. In the, the visual stimuli, if you look up here like this, the part of your visual field that Co corresponds to this edge is going to be driven in some ways, but here is not going to be driven. So there are some parts that are going to be driven and not other parts. So it's kind of like a homogeneous structure getting driven unevenly, like heated to uneven. Okay? So this is the analogy that I would like to make. So when, it, when you are showing it, say, uh, uh, it definitely looks like an, uh, a system out of equilibrium. And the uh, local, so the local population. Hmm? Yeah, it's uh, both external. If you are in the input layer, then it's mostly external input. If you are deeper in, it's from other brain regions. It's both. It's both the stimuli or other uh, brain region. Okay, but those things are very specific. They tend to uh, excite some places, not excite other places. Okay, and then locally, you have like the mo little model that I showed you. It's got a finite number of parameters. It's a finite number of things that kind of determines what they are. And the non-equilibrium steady state systems, in some sense, the balancing of all of those things, uh, all of the, okay, so you're not balancing energy fluxes, but you're balancing excitation and inhibition. But it's kind of the balancing of these things. And then finally, you can also, just like the idea of LTE, think of the you know, non-equilibrium steady state of a, this piece structure as a continuum of local dynamic equilibrium, the EI balance locally that kind of gives that. So this is the analogy that I want to show you. So here's another example, okay? So what I showed you before was this right-hand row. 
This was when it was high contrast. Now if I decrease contrast, it's like, it's like you are putting, uh, uh, you're heating up <laughs> these parts, but not other parts, right? It's kind of like the temperature. So these are heated less, right? Those are heated more, right? kind of lower contrast, okay? These are all kind of simulation results from, from our 50,000 uh, neuron model. Now, uh, it's an invariant measure. Invariant measures are not still objects, right? They're not static objects. They move around, okay? This is what is really happening. The milliseconds are ticking up there. So I could. This is the picture. I, I don't know what, what this is the what firing is rate, no coin time firing rate. Uh -huh. Okay, they they are interacting and firing at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this this is kind of what what it looks like. The I, I have actually done a lot of convolutions. Otherwise, it would give people ep epileptic seizures. It's really fast. <laughs> kind of like that. So okay. What, what, what's, what's generating the the, the wavelength? It, it's doing it on its own, completely emergent. But it depends on some, some of the connectivity. It, the connectivity is isotropic. It's uh, we try to use the length of that. I don't. I cannot understand the two-dimensional waves that are happening. I, I don't. I don't have a good grasp of that. Yeah. Well, the. Uh, there is a somewhat periodic thing, right? Because, the, because w once it goes up, it tends to, s some other part gets up and it tends to suppress you and then you get, you know, there, I, I can make heuristics, but I cannot do it precisely, okay? Okay, so last page, okay? So this is to, just to uh, give you, just to kind of summarize, put things into context. So people have made lots of dynamical models of cortex, okay? They have, uh, so they started with Hodgkin Huxley, systems of ODs, uh, what I use in uh, integrating fire. Those, uh, nobody knows who really started that, but anyway. Uh, so there are lots of different uh, models. And then f those are models of single neurons. They don't tell you what happens when you put two of them together, it's just one, okay? And then there is, uh, people started to look at bigger pieces, and then they make low dimensional models. Like what if we only keep track of two numbers, firing, e firing rate, I firing rate, and you have face plane analysis, that's the next phase. Then people got fancier and they say, oh, how about if I network, a whole network of couple uh, uh, neurons, okay? And then people say, well, let's make it fancier still. How about if we make it a network, and then each net, it's a network of networks, right? So you have a little network of couple, li like, like the local population that I talked about, but you have another network, each one of those is, uh, is, is one of those, and then maybe each one, uh, you can have different layers, okay? So what I like to propose is that if you keep going like this a finite number of times, you will never really get to the, the structure. It's not compatible with that. The in neuroanatomy is really not compatible with that. You can divide this some number of times, and then you can't anymore. They actually, they, they, they're not divided into networks and networks of these low homogeneous population. That's just not the model. Instead, they kind of, they, they, they at, s at some point it stops and it really becomes layers, okay? So the further decomposition is actually within the, the layers, okay? And the layers I'm gonna approximate with a, a roughly 2D network that are spatially homogeneous and uh, translation for mathematicians, translationally invariant structures, right? So that kind of puts you very quickly into a, 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 a something with a regular translationally invariant structure, but inhomogeneous drive kind of makes the, a little bit of a, um, a correspondence to the picture of non-equilibrium static, okay? And I can see the system as non-equilibrium steady state as a, as a continuum of local dynamic equilibria. So then, finally, the problem gets boiled down to this local picture, which is really in the domain of dynamical systems. And I have been trying very hard to talk my dynamical systems colleagues into getting interested in these things. These are, these are, th these are a couple of dynamical systems. Uh, so see, p the, a, lot of the, a lot of the motivation has come from physics. So people look at couple dynamical systems, couple maps. They always couple the same map. Okay. But it's actually two different opposing ones. That's what makes this different and very interesting. And most things in biology are really of that kind, not two, but many, right? They, they kind of have opposing effects. They're trying to kind of balance off each other. And I think we gotta get better at these, with these guys. And I'm working on it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.